Join Tony Atlas Live Friday night, June the 29th at MWF Studios in Melrose, Massachusetts for a new Memories and Legends taping. It's the aftermath of the latest shocking blockbuster episode that examines the psyche of the WWE Hall of Famer. Admission to this taping is free, but we need fan support from around the globe to help make these productions happen. Visit bostonwrestling.com and use the link below to explore our Indiegogo campaign we have ongoing to fund these expensive production shoots that will help bring Tony's story to life for fans to enjoy and learn from for decades to come. Tony will also be available for autographs and pose photos the night of the taping for a moderate fee. Time permitting, we're looking to have a Q&A with the fans as well. No purchase required. It's absolutely free. We really want the fans to come out and enjoy themselves and our ongoing efforts to give fans the best value and the best experience in professional wrestling. I think WrestleMania 1 is what got Vince McMahon started. That's it. The buildup of that, everything about it, the timing, everything worked together. You know, even their enemies, uh, Ted Turner, were helping us. Because every other word, they would say something about WW, you know, F. I mean, yeah, the thing you do is don't say nothing about your enemy. Right. They didn't. <laughs> so they made us even better. Yep. Uh, they cut their own throat. Now, I don't think whatever her name is, Cindy Lauper, and all those people in that, all it did is give it a, that little glitter, but did it help? They come out there to see a show, buddy, and they got it. Boston, 20 years ago, you witnessed unimagined hell when mankind took on The Undertaker in Hell in a Cell. On Sunday, June 24th, hardcore legend Mick Foley brings his 20 years of hell stage show to Laugh Boston. The WWE Hall of Famer will take you on a thrilling and surreal in-depth experience, reliving one of the most infamous nights in wrestling history. VIP experience and tickets are on sale now. Visit realmickfoley.com for complete event information. 20 Years of Hell is selling out around the country. Get your tickets now to join Mick Foley live. Stephanie came in the dressing room where I would have had me in a dressing room where can nobody see me. And uh, that was my first time ever meeting her, but she said she met me when she was a little girl, but I can't remember. Mm -hmm. And treated me so nice. And they told me what they wanted to do. Even when I was doing it, I wasn't for sure. <laughs> Uh, what what divas were? <laughs> I slept in cars, all because I didn't have enough money to get myself a motel room. So they came back, and they said, "Baba, so please do the job for John A's." I said, "Nope, I ain't doing it." And they are doing them. Come on, go on and do the job for it. It ain't gonna hurt you. Go on and do the job. I said, fuck you too. <laughs> Wrestling fans, visit bostonwrestling.com for the latest information on Millennium Wrestling Federation live events, in-studio shoot interview tapings, documentaries, news videos, history videos, and more. This is Mick Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Wrestling fans from around the corner, around the world, welcome to another installment of Memories and Legends. I'm Dan Marotti, joined by my good friend, 
of just about Tony Atlas, Mr. USA, WWE Hall of Fame of 2000 and one, two, three, four, five, six. 2006 in Chi-Town. Funny enough, Tony, this pay-per-view weekend, it's Father's Day weekend, it's money in the bank for WWE coming from uh, Chicago, Illinois itself, where you were inducted for the Hall of Fame. That's right. Chicago had been a, a, a landmark for wrestling dating all the way back to the Aaron Sheik and with, uh, uh, Vern Gagne. And in fact, in Chicago, with the first time I met uh, uh, Mr. T, he was a wrestling fan. He used to come and sit ringside and cheer along and watch all of us wrestlers. So, uh, 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 the WWE is uh, going uh, places that they have been going for for generations. Well, Chicago knows its wrestling. It loves its wrestling. Yes. Every WWE pay-per-view weekend now, we're going to be bringing you a special episode of Memories and Legends over on the BostonWrestling.com super site. Also, have some exciting news about our Patreon a campaign where fans are going to be able to go over the top with the entire library of great Millennium Wrestling Federation studio shoot interviews, this talk show, and our great in-ring action. But Tony, uh, we polled the fans over at, at MWF Project X on Twitter, and one of the questions uh, that the fans really seemed to want some answers to were, uh, I guess th the best way to sum up all of these questions would be some of your vices, perhaps, some of the things that maybe held you back at certain times in the king of sports professional wrestling. Some very interesting topics here on the sheet. Uh, it's well known in many circles. I don't think it's exactly a secret that you ha certainly have a love of feet, a foot fetish. That's right. Well, you see, when I first started in wrestling, if uh, you didn't have something strange about you, you was in the wrong business. I mean, I've seen stuff in... Uh, wrestling that the owner person uh, probably had never seen in their life. You know, I've seen things where there'd be one lady and ten guys in a room having intercourse. Yeah. I've seen things where guys like to get beat up, and I was one of them guys. I let women kick me in the face well, and stuff like that. Well, we're going to talk about that, Tom. Now, yeah. a lot of people have to say, uh, why do you do that? Well, I, I'm no psychologist. I, 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 I don't uh, claim to know a lot. In fact, there's a lot of things I don't know. But one day I was sitting on the airplane, and this lady was sitting there. She watched me. I kept looking at her shoes, so me and her got into a conversation. And uh, she said, well, how was your childhood? And I said, told her, I said, well, my dad was very abusive type of man. He beats my mother. He beat us. He was very, very abusive type of man. And she said, do you have any siblings, any brothers or sisters. I said, well, it was four boys, and we all came out different. I said, I came up liking women to physically abuse me. My brother, youngest brother, grew up, and he liked to abuse women. He physically abused two women. I have another brother that is two years older than me, and he cannot commit to any relationship because the relationship between my mother and my father was so horrible that he, he just couldn't commit to any relationship. Now, my older brother, who spent 35 years in the military, he's a veteran, and uh, he, everything got to be in order. If you go up and you shake his hand, he will wash his hands. If, 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 when he pack his bag, he would earn and fold his socks. He would earn and fold his underwear. If you see a picture on the wall, he had to get up and straighten it out. If you see a chair, if it's uneven or set and crooked, he had to straighten it out. So he wanted order because he came from such a disorder uh, uh, a relationship. So what the psychologist told me that mainly what I do when, uh, when, a, when a, a woman is doing that to me, uh, really I become my father and the woman become my mom. Mm -hmm. So if I come down the street and I saw any man, I don't care if he's married to her, if it's his daughter or what, hit a woman, I have to hit him. I can't stand for a man to hit a woman. My daughter was born, my ex-wife. She always tried to get me to spank her. I couldn't do it. I couldn't bring myself to spank that little girl because mm -hmm. I, I can't stand to see a woman uh, 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 being hit. But I love to see women beating up guys. I like that. It's, it's non-sexual. I don't get a, what people think. And, uh, you know, my foot fetish is totally different than, than toe sucking and all this other stuff that people 
is into. I don't get sexually aroused from a woman stepping on me or, or kicking on me or, or anything. In fact, I get such energy of happiness and joy. It's almost like caffeine, these feet? Like it's more like a caffeine hit. Yes. You know, it, 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 I just get a tremendous uh, energy from it. And, I, I, and the woman, what I've noticed, they feel like for once, they feel dominant. So it, I, I get my, my enjoyment of seeing the, dump, the smile and the dominancy on a, on, a, uh, on a woman's face. If you look at any, if you have seen any photograph or anything on the internet of a woman standing on her, you look up at her face, you see this big bright smile. Because for once, she is she in power. And due to the fact that I'm a, a, a ex bodybuilder and a forward wrestler and got, still got 22 inch arm, to be my size, it really makes, because one lady say, if you was a small guy, it wouldn't mean as much to me. But it, it just make women feel good to dominate a big, strong man. Well, at what point do you remember being excited by these feet? It, is it the, I was, is it a I mean, naked I was foot? In, is I was, it certain kind of shoes? What is it, it, it well, It's got to be a certain type of shoe. You yeah. see, in today's time, it's hard to find a woman that dressed like a woman. You know, I'm, I'm an old man, so I remember when women wore skirts, when they wore dresses. Uh, women don't dress like women no more. Yeah. And then when you look at, they wear these athletic shoes, but the only thing different between a woman's shoe today and a man's shoe is the size. They look the same. Yes, so mainly yeah. I was more, more uh, into a, 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 a woman's shoe that is more of a, more of a slip-on fashion, more so than a, a lace-up. If you go back to the older days, women's shoes in the 60s and 70s didn't have shoelaces. Men's shoes had shoelaces. Women's uh, uh, shoes were more of like a slip-on type. You know, like where you see like Vans. Or one of my favorite today is uh, uh, Skechers make a good shoe called uh, Go Walk. Mm -hmm. And it's a slip-on shoe. It don't mm -hmm. have shoe strings in it and stuff like that. But if you look at all the, if you take a woman's shoe and you take a man's shoe, you put them right beside each other, you couldn't tell the difference. There's a lot of things that have changed uh, uh, over the years. Not to get into it too much, but I remember talking to Rocket Johnson mm -hmm. uh, probably about a year or so ago. And we were talking about, you know, when we wrestled down south, with, you know, in, in Tennessee and Georgia and North Carolina and all these different places. And Rocker would tell me a story about the promoter came up to him. I don't want to call the name because I may have it right. If you ever talk to Rocker, he would know the name of the promoter. And they had this wrestler called Norvell Austin. Mm -hmm. And he said, Rocker, Rocker, you got to do what Norvell do. He said, we're going to team you up with him. Y'all can do the same thing. Rocker Johnson said, well, what did Norvell do? So Rocker Johnson, remind you, is a very proud man. You know, he, he, he worked out hard. He trained with Muhammad Ali. And he's a very proud man and, and, and he, uh, a very great athlete, one of the best athletes uh, in pro wrestling uh, that I have met, along with Bob Backlund and Jimmy Slooker. He was, he was right up in one of the best. When you look at the physique, tell he was a, a heck of an athlete. Right. But anyway, they said, well, what did Rocket do? He said, well, you just watch this. He said, well, if you do it, the people would love it. So Norvell also would be in the ring, and he'd be down, and the guy would be beating on him. And he started to make what we call a comeback, which means he's going to start fighting back. But before he come, started coming back, he turned into a monkey. And go, ooh, 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 ooh. And he just bounced around the range just like a monkey. And the people, he said, look here, the people love it. I want you to do that, Rocky. <laughs> Rocky, look at it. Rocky said it took everything in him not to slap this promoter across the room. But during that period of time, it was acceptable to, to, to do that. It and was degrading. Well, it was acceptable. I don't know. It was, you think if, it was acceptable? Well, it was. In, in this country, it was acceptable. And then I, I, what made me think of that story is the Roseanne uh, uh, incident. For her to come up with that certain turn, yeah. it was common. It was common. I remember a scientist come on TV one day and said that he did a scientific study that black brain was smaller than a white person's brain. Yeah. Then I became a certified personal trainer and found out that he didn't tell the truth. But they always had these certain things that, 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 that fit certain people. 
you know, we in the old they call it stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Just like Jimmy Slooker, that was the favorite Ronnie Piper with the coconut. You know, he wanted to climb trees and, and get coconut because he was from the islands. So if you're from the islands, and if you're Irish, you're supposed to be a drunk. Right. So we all had our, these stereotypes, and, and these stereotypes, would, uh, uh, people believe them. And in my day, believe it or not, people didn't think wrong of it. No. Nobody on neither side of the fence really think, uh, uh, thought of, of, of wrong of it. Now, if I had, if I could say, I'd probably get a lot of in trouble for saying this. The worst thing, what was ABC? Yes. The worst thing they did was cancel that show. Would you let but, Roseanne walk on you? No, her feet too small. I like women right. size 10 and up. Anybody, exactly. anybody that wears like a 7, 8, she got little feet. So I can tell you, she got little now, bitty just feet. So the, I know this is a, this is a very personal because subject. Because I, I started my foot fetish when I was a kid. Yeah. So it, I never got kids to do it. I got women to do it. So you imagine a, a 10-year-old kid get like a 17 or 18-year-old girl to walk on him. Then the girl, to him, his feet is big. She can wear a size six, but to a kid, them big feet. Big feet, yes. Them, them yeah. are big feet. But with the Roseanne thing, not to get off subject, I would have did what, if it was wrestling, and that had happened in my day, not in today's time, in my day, we would have put that into the program and have her to work through her problems in the program. Because one thing that people always got to remember, you cannot solve a problem by hiding it in the closet. You can't solve a problem by sticking it under the rug. There's a million of people in America, and not just in America. I've been to England. I hear it in England. I hear it in Germany. So America is not exclusive with this or how we feel different about different races. The best way to do this is to put it in, write it into the strip and watch her go through her problems on screen. The reason race relationship was really started to improve in the olden days, because instead of getting angry about it, we was able to learn about it and understand it in a comical way. And we've done this with the Jefferson, we've done this with Red Fox, and we've done this with uh, Archie Bunker. Mm -hmm. And we was pretty much over it, pretty much over it. And we was going along well, and then all of a sudden they come along with political correctness, which I think set us back. Because if you don't talk about something, I rolled up and down the street with Captain Redneck Dick Murdoch. Mm -hmm. And it's no stranger to the rest of the world that he was racist. Correct. He was a member of the KKK. He was racist. But... He told me one day, he said, Tony, I like you. You do? What do you do? Like to tie me to a cross and burn me? No, no, he started laughing. He said, no, I like you as a friend. If anybody ever mess with you, he said, I'll, I'll be there for you. Now, this is a claimsman tell me that. And so I asked him why. I never judged him. He had a right to feel the way he felt. And he liked me because I didn't judge him or criticize him for feeling that way. I didn't agree with the way he felt because I didn't have the same sentiment, but I felt he had the right to feel that way, to talk that way, to think that way, as long as he didn't act upon it. Did he ever use derogatory remarks towards you? No, there was nobody in pro wrestling in the 70s that didn't, that didn't use the N-word. So you nobody. rode with Dick Murdoch and he personally I, I was, used the word towards I was you? Called, I was called... By Dick the, Murdoch. The, yeah, yeah, I was called... No, Murdoch wouldn't use it. Murdoch would not, even Murdoch though he was a member of the KKK. He, he would not use it. All right. But everybody else did. All right. Come now, what, if Murdoch was a card-carrying member of the KKK, right? why wouldn't he use the word? Because that's something that you would probably have to ask Murdoch, but I okay. remember he never used the word. Really? I never, find that very interesting. Never used the word. But a lot of other people did. I mean, I was called... The N word so many times in the 70s that one day somebody said, Tony, I didn't answer. I didn't know who they were talking to. It was very common in the dressing room. Mm -hmm. It was just a very common word when they talked about us because we was, my mother used to tell us, sticks and stone would break your, your bones, but names would never hurt. So we was kind of not paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. Now, they had other wrestlers that couldn't handle it. I mean, especially my, my, my friend Thunderbolt Patterson. I mean, he couldn't handle it for, for, for nothing. Mm -hmm. Ole Anderson 
Every time he talked to me, he used the word. Really? It came out of old Anderson's mouth like, like, like water out of a, a sink. And I could name thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of other wrestlers that have used the term. They have not only just black words. Ivan Puska got called a dumb Polak every day of his life. A d dumb Polak every day of his life. You know, Captain Lou Albano got called name because he was Italian. I ain't going to call the name, but you know what name Kidding, they used yeah. for him. No, it was another one. Uh, w. Oh, what? I, you could say it. I ain't going to say that. I got a lot of Italian friends. I, I just can't say that. But you see what I'm saying? That, that, he was called that a lot. Now, what Vince McMahon did, and nobody noticed, there's two things Vince got rid of, and nobody noticed. Yeah, right. All your top wrestling stars from 1980, I mean, from 19, yeah, 1980, because that's when I started. Anything before that, I don't know. From 1980 to 1985, if you notice, they was all minorities. Because mm -hmm. Vince Sr. felt that you should have a person to represent every group of people in the in the like the big city, like like when you come to Boston, you know you got Irish, you got Scottish, you got Black, you got Jamaicans, you you got uh, Oriental, so you got a mixer of different groups of people in all your big major city. So Vince figured you should have a person to represent each person in there. What Vince Jr. did in 1985, he took all the minorities off the top and put Caucasians on top. Mm -hmm. That was the Earl of Huck Hogan. Randy Savage, uh, they have not been a top black wrestler since JYD in the main event, what we call the main event, you know, right. top, yep, top, top position. They never even pushed Mark Henry to that level, even though he had the ability to go that level. Well, I knew Booker T had a main event run with them. Ah, uh, um, but he never got that level. Rock? Yeah, yeah. No, no, the Rock is Samoan. Yeah. Yeah, he's Samoan. But, but what you see... Point I mean, is you look, very well right, made. Well, even now, well even made. now, you look back behind you. I yeah, mean, you no, see the same. Right. Yeah, you see the same thing. You know, when you look at TV, you, you know, you see you see a lot of Caucasian. You don't see, and then the do the blacks that they do got. Can't no black person watch them. Yeah, I can't watch them booty hole guys. I know you. You're not I a fan of the new day. That. I can't watch that Stetcher Fletcher guys coming out there grinding in the air. I can't watch it. I, I can't. I, every time it come on, I watch the program. I, I change it. I, I can't watch it. All right, Tony. Well, we can get into race relations. But they on could, a, right, but they're continue. making money at it. People they're doing like very it. well. Yeah, they're doing very well with it, you know. But you, it's not your personal cup of tea. No, no, no. Well, right no, now, no. I, and this is a very interesting topic, and I, I don't think you're wrong by any stretch of the imagination. I really want to focus in on these, this subject that the fans wanted to discuss with certain vices. Now, you began to have a love. It's not a lust. It's a love for these feet. No, no. no. You keep saying feet. I shoes. Like it's shoe, shoe, it's women's a shoe shoes. Thing. Yeah, you see, I was raised in the country. So I just want to clarify, it, it's not men's shoes, it's only women's shoes. Women. Okay. No, I, I want nothing to do with no man and no kind okay. of way. Ain't got nothing to do with no man. I just man. wanted to clarify. No, yeah, it, I want to clarify that too. I want nothing right. to do with no man. So you're not, no any, you're not interested in any Air no Jordans No, anything. Like nothing man. Okay. Ain't nothing a man can do for me. <laughs> nothing a man can do for me. All no. right, good. It's up to be my friend. Absolutely. I like men's friends. There you now, go. Now, I may tease with you. Just play along with you because guys, it part of just being a wrestler, guys would rip you about anything. Sure. Oh, that's you know, wrestling. I went in the shower for my first time and all the guys come in, big guys, hairy chest, garlic smelly guy. Oh, man, look at the pretty ass on Tony Atlas. For about a week, I was afraid to take a shower with, with him. <laughs> then George Scott, who was my mentor, said, Tony, they just, they're just ripping you. Yeah. He said, don't put them over. He said, next time they tell him you got a pretty ass, tell them they got one too. If you don't sell it, don't stop. Don't no. sell it. Don't put it over. Don't put it over. So sure enough, they came in and told me I had a pretty ass. I said, yeah, you got a pretty nice white ass, too. And then they left me alone because they couldn't rip me no more. Right. Well, people have certain vices in life. I mean, it's a, it's a normal thing in this day and age, especially with the Internet being the way it is. But at what point did this love of these women's shoes and the love I of the, think, the, the feeling of the feet begin to interfere with your wrestling career? Because it to, did at one point. Yes, yes it did. It, it, yes, it did. And one thing that, uh, that uh, uh, this lady wrestler told me one time, she said, I thought Vince was a genius. I said, he is. She said, because I told her a story, and all the wrestlers know this story, I, and I, SD almost brought it up at the Hall of Fame. SD and I, we was tag team partner long before Rocket Johnson came to WWE. He wasn't even in the WWE. Then it was me and it was Tony Atlas and SD Special Delivery Jones. 
And, and the, the world tag team champion at that time was Mr. Fuji and Saito. And we worked a, a program the, the month before at the Philly, at Philadelphia Spectrum. Mm -hmm. And where I got busted open, I got blood. And so they took me back to the dress room. So SD had to fight both of them by himself. Mm -hmm. So just as they started getting the best of SD, here I come down the, the ring doing the old, you know, 1776 gimmick. My head was wrapped and everything. You always know. works. Yeah, it always, always works. works. And so I come running to the ring where the people got all excited and everything. So I ran them off. Then it came back in the following match where it was uh, Tony Guerrero and Rick Montel was going to fight Fuji and Saito mm -hmm. with special referee guest Tony Atlas. Oh, okay. Where the same thing happened. They jumped me again. Now I'm coming back the following week to for the title. And, and uh, that the week before, Captain Lou Iban always tried to give me advice. He was a great guy. He said, Tony, don't screw up. They're going to go all the way with you if you don't mess it up. They're going to go all the way with you. So I went to tell this girl on the phone, and she said, I got some new tennis shoes. I said, you do? She said, oh, yeah, I, these shoes are going to walk all over you when you get here. And I said, well, it's going to be about two months before I have any time off to leave. I said, I'm booked solid straight for two months. I said, maybe you can catch a ticket to come here. And then she said, well, you can come here for one day. They're not going to miss you. And she kept talking about these tennis shoes, kept talking about their tennis shoes. Finally, I took a left, got hopped on an airplane, left my car at the Newark airport. For some reason, Chief Stormboat came up to me, and my keys were locked in the car. And I said, then I locked my keys in the car. I said, I can't get to the show tonight. I was happy. Now, Chief, to me, I, he was trying to help me. I thought he was, was you messing up things, because now I got an excuse to go. I can't get in my car. So Chief said, well, I would take you to Philly. He said, this is one of the most important nights of your life, so you need to go to Philly tonight. You really need to be there. And uh, he said, I'd take you to Philly, and I would get a locksmith, and we'd come back here. I would bring you back here where you could get your car. I said, darn it. If I, do, if I go with Chief, I ain't going to get them tennis shoes. So I said, no, I, I don't want to do that because at the locksmith, blah, 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 I just was saying all type of stuff. She said, what the hell am I doing? I'm going to bring you back. So as he's talking, I'm walking away. I'm trying to get away from Chief because mm -hmm. all I could think about were them damn shoes. Got on the airplane. Went, and back then, you could buy a ticket at the counter. You just throw the money down. Yeah, you could yep. buy a ticket in cash back then. You know, this is about well, 81 or 82. You could just pay cash right. for your ticket. So I got me a, a plane ticket. I flew all the way to L.A. The girl walked on me and everything. We did our thing. Now I had to find out a reason to come back. I told that story to this lady wrestler named Amanda Storm. Mm -hmm. She said, see, I told you Vince ain't no genius. I said, why is that? He said, if he was smart, he would have got a girl and paid her just to follow you around with a pair of tennis shoes. He said, he would have hired that girl to follow you around. He said, that way you wouldn't have to hop a plane to go get it. That's why people, uh, the barbarian, I told him about it. He said, oh, I want to see it, boss. I want to see that. He got an airline storage it to walk on me 30,000 feet in the air. So you had, uh, geez, I don't, I'm trying to think of the term that maybe you'd use for uh, the, uh, well, I'm going to have to try and be a little bit more discreet about that, but you actually had this foot experience up in the air. 30,000 30, feet, 35,000 feet in the air. I laid out in the aisle there, and the stewardess walked on me. The barbarian loved it. Is there a version of the Mile High Club for people with a foot fetish? Well, there's, there's a lot of people that got certain things, but a lot of people keep things uh, under wrap because we are so judgmental. Yeah. I had a buddy of mine that was, was telling me a funny story. He comes by my house. We invite him over for dinner. He said, me, he take me fishing a lot. I go hunting with him a lot up in Maine. I live in Maine. Yeah. And he said, he would say, well, you know Tony Atlas got a, you know, got a shoe fanny. He said, yeah. He said, yeah, he let him, the girls walk on him in tennis shoes. He said, he said oh, that's sick. That's what he told my buddy. Oh, that's sick. Let the girl step on you with the shoes on. So 
This other girl came along. As they were talking, the woman came along, and he asked the woman, said, can I see your feet? So the woman took the shoe up. He started sucking her toes. To him, sucking toes is okay. Mm-hmm. Getting stuck on his set. Not the but shoe. not the shoe. You see what I'm saying? Now, he's an old toe sucker. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm an old face walker. And we both, is, you know, what, what, what we call normal. But his normalcy to him was more normal than my normalcy. Like another person could be gay. He figured he's more normal or, 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 than another person that is maybe into S&M. You see? Yeah. We, everybody got something that don't fit. When you left, when you walked out on WWE in the middle of that run, when you were supposed to go to Philadelphia, did you miss something in particular that night that was going to happen that you know of or not? I took, it, took away S.D. Jones' one and only chance of becoming champion. Wow. He was, we was going to, according to the way Chief were talking. Wow. The chief said, this is going to be one of the most important days of your life. And on top of it, I was, they would start, I was starting the program with me in Backland. I wrestled Backland in, in Baltimore the week before that. Mm-hmm. And Backland got disqualified. They was working towards making me the first black world champion. So I think what the idea was to first put the world belt, a tag belt tag with me and SD. Yeah. Then have, and because I remember talking to the Moon Dog, he was in Japan. And they were going to bring the Moon Dolls in, and me and SD were going to drop the title to the Moon Dog. Mm-hmm. That's why they wanted SD with me, because SD was going to be the one to drop the title. Then I was going to move on and go against Backlund for the uh, world championship. World you see, that was the plan. But then I walked out, and all their plans got squashed. In hindsight, do you regret? Oh, no, I mercy. Yes, I do. Yes, you I passed do. probably a lot of money. Yes, yes I do. Yeah. Because people that got fetishes. Because a fetish is hard to fulfill. It, it's very, very hard to fulfill. Uh, if you want to do something normal, you can find anybody do something normal. It's very difficult to get a person to step on you. Maybe they're mad it, I at mean, you. have you ever had odd reactions from people that you've asked all to step time, on you? Because it's something that they don't understand. Mm-hmm. So, so I get that all the time. So because, do people think it's a joke when you ask them to walk Well, what you? it is, it, it's something... A fetish is something that is so unordinary that it's hard to get. Yeah. It's very, very hard to get people uh, uh, to, uh, to do that. I can get oral sex from a woman easier than I can get walked on. You know, that'd be no it's problem. It's considered more normal. It's more normal in her in their way of thinking because, because we all live in this little bubble of how things should be. Yeah. And we don't know that, that out of every human being that was ever born on this earth, since biblical time, since Adam and Eve, not one person had been born since the beginning of time with the same DNA or fingerprint. Mm-hmm. So we all got different things that, that we seem not normal uh, to me, but very normal to another person. Mm-hmm. You know, years and years ago, in, uh, uh, we had what they call a church, and the church kept us in a certain land. So people always did things in secret, mm-hmm. behind the dark doors, behind closet. They, they hid and did what they want to do so they could fit into society. I just got tired of hiding. Did I, you have to hide the love of the shoes? Oh, yeah. Well, I did. used to tell girls all type of stuff. I'd tell them, she said, why do you want me to walk out? I said, my muscles are so tight that, that uh, uh, massaging with your hand don't work. So only the pressure of being walked. Of the shoe. Right. Uh, they had to walk. They, 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 the first thing they used to always do is try to take the shoes off. I said, no, 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 no. Leave the shoes on. Keep I them did, on. Yeah, but they want to take them off. Every time I say walk them back, they go to take the shoes off. And then I... Uh, now, I'm going to ask you this, Tony. Would, uh, that would you only have them do it with new shoes or used shoes? Well, would you it, have people walk in off the street with, you know, dirty bottoms of their well, feet and walk on? Shoes it depends on how on bad the urge is. Really? See, so there were it, times it, someone right. would come in walking on the street, and then you'd have them walk if all the over urge, you. If the urge is right, yeah. Really? Yeah. But one thing about having a shoe fetish, and if those that have seen the tape, I allow women to punch me and kick me because I become so submissive that I let her do what she wants to make her feel more dominant. My job is to make that woman feel dominant. And well, a lot of women got a lot of built-up frustration. Yes. So they... 
as, as a man would say, it's a great way to relieve PMS, whatever that is. But, but she used to love punching guys and kicking guys and stomping guys. She absolutely, she even when we got into wrestling, she started wrestling guys. Because I think it's every woman dream, not every one, but it's, I bet there's a thousand women out here that would love to have a guy just to stand there and let them punch him in the face a couple of times. Because it's a feeling of dominancy. And because of my size and my built and everything, they was, like guys would always laugh and joke in the dressing room, yeah, you know, that Tony got that foot fat, ha, 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 ha. And I looked over and I see the woman, she kind of looking at me out of the corner of her eye. As soon as the guys leave the room, that woman would come over and say, tell me a little bit more about that foot thing you got there. How did that work? Because what woman would not want to stomp a man in the face or punch him in the face? Well, Tony, I think this might be a good segue into uh, certainly one of the most adult topics we've ever discussed here in the Millennium Wrestling Federation. Uh, this is certainly, if it is, this has gone past the point where we have anyone under the age of 18 watching, we recommend uh, you don't. Uh, I thought perhaps the most odd situation I'd ever face in this studio, to me, was the Iron Sheik sitting in your chair talking about how he wanted to anally violate B. Brian Blair to make him humble at WrestleMania 3. Then, earlier today, for the very first time, I saw one of the videotapes you discussed in your autobiography that was watched on, I believe, a WWE mm -hmm, European mm -hmm. tour on a plane. And I'm taking over 200 kicks to the face. Fan We're not going to show you the whole video. Uh, maybe what we could do is for fans that are really interested in seeing it, maybe a separate, like a DVD type release. I think uh, again, it's, it's not illegal. It's not pornography or anything like no that. Bond, no bond. No. But it's sense. just it's a little unusual. I guess is maybe the best That's way to the put best it word. To, to me and to a lot of folks that don't have this fetish, this vice mm -hmm. for these feet. We're going to take a look at some home video. I Tony. do it in the ring with Lexi Rose. I didn't know that. There is a video on if you look at Lexi Rose, foot slave. Yeah. And there's a video of her kicking and stomping me in the ring. All right, fans, maybe yeah. we'll, we'll take a look at this for a few minutes. We're going to yeah. come back, and Tony can perhaps describe to you what we just watched. Wrestling fans, as we run the warning graphic again, I want to clearly state that the following personal footage uh, from Tony Atlas's video library is not suitable for children. I want to stress that there's nothing illegal about the following footage. It's not pornographic or anything like that. It's just unusual to most folks. Tony uh, provided over an hour worth of footage, and we can't show all of that right now. We're just going to look at it for a few minutes. For fans that may be interested in all of the content, uh, Tony has wanted to make a full-length DVD documentary of this episode and at the conclusion of the DVD version uh, provide all of the raw footage over an hour's worth uh, which you can find links for on bostonwrestling.com and our social media platforms this summer. Uh, what may be strange to some of us and it is to me I'll be honest this is common for Tony it is something that makes him happy it gives him energy uh, Tony's not hurting anyone uh, Tony wants us to present the following footage to encourage a sense of understanding.
Man, let's see. <laughs> let me see. Tell me. This alone is worth the trip. Where's this thing crawling behind me? Oh yeah, there you go. Lick them harder there. Yeah. I want you to lick those so hard that I can feel it on the bottom of my foot through those two inch soles. Or I'll crack your skull open like an egg. You got that there, Atlas, Tony? Yeah, lick that, yeah. So how does it feel to be crawling on the ground and licking my feet like a piece of human waste? Huh? Yeah, that's what you are. You're a piece of human waste. All right, Tony. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. I don't know yeah. if you want to give a little history to that. I mean, how you put that... How you? How did you produce she had, it? She had a lot of frustration. Yes. And how best way of getting rid of frustration is to punch a bag. Well, I became that punch a bag for her. Mm -hmm. And now, I ain't no psychologist. Like I said, I'm not uh, all that smart. But what that lady told me on the airplane, see, one thing about that is different back then it, than what it is today. Today, I would have not got the, the information that I'm about to share with y'all. Because today, you're selling a flight with somebody, they, they either uh, on their cell phone or on their iPod. So you can sit right next to a professor from a university and want, and want to say two words with them because you both is miles away, even though you're sitting beside each other, you're both miles and miles away. But in the olden days, they didn't have cell phone or iPods on the airplane. So when you sit down with somebody, you say, well, how you doing? They said, well, how you doing? I said, good. He said, and most of the time, they would start a conversation because of my physique back sure. in the old days. So they said, oh, man, you pretty big. And the first thing they used to always say to me, you play football. That, that used to right. be the yeah. first word to come out of their mouth. And I said, no, I'm a pro wrestler. They said, oh, pro wrestler. So then I would talk a little bit about it. They said, I used to, I said, do you, do you know Bruno San Martino? I go, yeah, I know Bruno. So we talk a little bit about Bruno. You know Andre the Giant? Yeah, I know Andre the Giant, so we'll talk a little bit about Andre. Then, so the conversation don't be strictly about me and not sound like I'm a bragger or, or, or something. I said, well, what did you do? And because I was so open to them, they opened up to me. So I asked this one lady one time, what did you do? She said, well, I'm a psychologist. So I explained to her about my foot thing. She asked me about my, uh, my childhood. And so I explained to her about, about my childhood and I she started telling me different things. And one of the things she said, she said, well, you probably got hooked on that when you was a child. That's why you like women with big feet. Because you had babysitters and it was all grown-ups around you. And to a, a, a six or seven-year-old or eight-year-old, because I remember in the first grade, uh, I tricked my first grade teacher to stand on my back. Because we were doing it, we were in class doing physical ed, and I was doing push-up. Everybody said, man, Tony could do a lot of push-up. I said, yeah, I can even do it when you're standing on my back. And so I said, I can do it with her on my back. And so she didn't know no better. 
So the, she, she stood on my back, and another two kids held her hands so she don't fall, and I think I did about two push-ups. And she tried to get off. I go, no, 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 don't get off. I can do some more. I can do some more. And she said, no, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. When she got off, I got mad at her. I remember getting mad at her because she wouldn't step on me no more. Wow. Well, Tony, how did that tape come to be? I mean, did you invite this person that you know over to your home no, with the we camera? Was... Or where did you record it? How did it happen? Well, well normally what I, what I do, I found out that I enjoy, got more pleasure out of watching them doing it to me. So you enjoyed watching a tape of it more than when it happened right, to you? Right, because really? I knew how to let the woman go all the way. Mm -hmm. Let her let all that frustration out. And every woman that I was, I had this one girl that used to step on me, kick me, and punch me. And uh, she was in Columbia, Ohio. Mm -hmm. and, and me and Tommy Rich, uh, we were at Georgia Championship Wrestling, and they started going to Columbus, Ohio, and Wheeling, West Virginia. So I left that area, and I went to the WWE. So she would drive from Columbus, Ohio, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, every time I was in Pittsburgh. And one day she bought some shoes, them, them that gum Nikes. And I looked at her feet, and SD had the same shoes on. I wouldn't let her do it. Really? So she went to SD. She said, SD, I drove all the way from Columbus, Ohio, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to walk on Tony, and he won't let me do it. She said, I'm mad. I want to step on somebody. I want to kick somebody, and Tony won't let me kick him tonight. So we went into the, we got into the, uh, uh, the car, and we drove to, drove away, and we found a Payless, and I bought her some shoes in Payless, and then she was happy. That's unbelievable. I have women to travel yeah. to do that. Because they travel where, where they feel, it make them feel powerful. Ladies, y'all don't believe me, when you go home to your husband, put on your tennis shoe, put him on the ground, kick him in the face 50 times, see how you feel like you get done doing it. What did Vince McMahon think of this? He never knew. He never knew about your never love of the shoes. Never knew what shocked the hell out of me. Never knew. I was with Vince in 2010. Right. And we was in somewhere in... Arizona or New Mexico, and Vince very rarely come down to the bar. Very rarely. We got in late, so Vince decided he's going to come down to, to come downstairs to, uh, to have a few drinks with the boys. He very rarely do this. He used to do it all the time in the older days, but here lately, he, you know, but he just enjoyed being around the boys. Vince is a great guy. Great guy. I don't care what nobody say about it. So the guy that was talking to him about Tony, he said, what, what about Tony? And so I have pictures of women stepping on me. So I show Vince one of the pictures. Now you Vince, carried them, these I pictures with picture you on with the road. Me. Yeah, I, I carried pictures with Is me on the road. Is the TSA ever examined yeah. these pictures of you being walked on? Yeah, I carry, I carry shoe pictures with me all the time. Well, what does the TSA say? Have they ever come across them? Who? The TSA, when you go through an airport. No, they don't look through for no. pictures. Wrestlers carry pictures, so they used to... They used to rest and carry them a little. I with yeah, the stack they, of eight they, by tens. Okay. They, they used to rest and carry pictures. All right. So what did Vince say when he saw these feet pictures? So Vince said, "Man, that's cool shit." And this was in 2010. Really? And he never knew. Now Triple H found out. An Undertaker. We was in Europe. We was in Europe, and I pulled out a tape. I said, "Y'all guys want to see something?" So I showed him this tape of this girl punching me and kicking me in the face. Now, you know, it's an airplane. Right. We're on an airplane. We're 30,000 feet up in the air. All the wrestlers from SmackDown got up, and they were all on one side of the plane trying to see this tape. The steward just come back scared to death. She said, y'all got to go back to your seat. You got to go back to your seat. We're going to crash the plane. It's like this, because all the weight just went to. Yep. She said, we got to wait there. So y'all got to go back to seat. So she had to get all the guys to go back to seat. But all that day, everybody was going, Tony, let me see that tape. Tony, let me see that tape. Tony, let me see that tape. Now, our troop, he saw the tape. So he put, he put my shoe thing as part of his match. Oh, did he? Yeah, 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 yeah. He get that on the ground when the girl is kicking him. He do the same thing I do. Oh, I Him see. and, uh, uh, what were they, MVP? What MVP, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, they, and they, 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 they used to imitate me, and I'm back in there. The guys are back in the back laughing, but people think it's part of the match. Mm-hmm. But they just put the Tony Atlas stuff in the match, you know. Wow. 
with, with the funny. Well, but if you notice, and you got a little heat for that tape, didn't you? By the end of the tour. Yeah, because what happened was everybody wanted to see it, so uh, Finley told me to put the tape up and don't show it no more. Yeah, now, now this picture here was taken in Harlem. I was in Harlem. I got mm -hmm. pictures in Germany that I took with women stepping on me in Germany, in, uh, in Harlem, in England, in Africa, in every state in the United States. Well, Tony, again, there's nothing illegal about it. It's, nope. not, it's not something I would consider X-rated. Nope. It's just a little unusual. It's un very unusual. Now, let me ask you this. Where you had the love of these feet, did not you have... Feet. I'm sorry, the shoes. The shoes. shoes. Did you have an interest in the ring rats on the road, the groupies? Yeah. Or was it only well, shoes? Well, you see, that's why a lot of guys wanted to be around me. Because the girl would go to my room, she'd walk on me, then I would take her downstairs and buy her a beer and buy her something to eat. Where the other guys, they want to do a little bit more. They said, Tony, are you going to have sex with them? I said, no. And they said, you mad if I do? I said, it's up to so her. So you didn't want sex with the rats? No, I didn't know. Really? No. Well, I didn't want him to walk on me. I tell you, you could have had, I'm sure, especially in your prime when you were a, a, a tremendous a, physical specimen. I always, I always had a woman for that. Well, but the thing about it, the woman that walked on me, I couldn't have sex with. And the woman I had sex that? with oh, couldn't walk on me. because of the psychological, the psychological thing behind thing. it. You didn't want to have sex with no, the foot, with No, because the, the reason why I'm doing okay. it, I'm, I'm doing it to, 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 to build a woman confident, to make, yeah. she's a, what you call a dominatrix. Right. And I'm what you call a foot slave. A slave cannot have sex with his master. She's queen for the day. She's okay. queen for the moment. She's the master. She's the dominant one. I'm the submissive one. I'm the servant. Well, I, I tell you, I wish Dr. David Reese was here with us this afternoon to try and break down uh, some of the psychological thoughts that go with this. But I do have to ask you, Tony, you mentioned earlier that you saw a lot on the road. I know in your book there were part of orgies. Even a mother-daughter action. I know our director in the other room is yeah. a big fan of that. He has a set here in Melrose and in Lake Winnipesaukee. They call him the Lebanon legend. Uh, is that something that really interested you anymore, or was it just totally the focus on well, well, the I, walking? When I first started wrestling in the late 60s, early 70s, they didn't want ordinary people. The more strange unusual. See, people got to realize wrestling started in the circus. In fact, all entertainment started in the circus. And they didn't have television and radio and all that stuff, so, so they, would have, they would have a parade. The parade would come downtown and they had the elephants, the, the monkeys, the tigers, the lions, the clowns, the acrobats. And they all would come, they would all march down, downtown uh, through downtown. They didn't have no malls. It was all downtown. And wrestling was a part of the carnival. In fact, wrestlers speak Conover. Right, like Connie, if, yep. they, Yeah, Connie. Connie would like, if they say Tony, and Connie is tis on it, you know? A Mark is Mizok. Right. And so even like Ric Flair, a lot of guys, they stay could speak it, you know? Right. Uh, and, and so wrestling was a part of the circus. Right. So, the, so like in a circus, you have to have strange things that you can't see every day. You don't see an Andre the Giant walking down the street right. every day. Yeah. You don't see a midget every day. You don't see a guy like George the Animal Steel that eat turnbuckles with green tongue every day. You don't see a missing link or undertaker every day. These was unusual looking and people. You, the further you go back in wrestling, the more unusual they become. Right. We had one guy, we called him the wolf man. I mean, he grew hair on his face. You know, his whole face, it, it was not fake. It was, that was just how he were. Mm -hmm. uh, we had another guy, uh, the angel, the French angel. And he had a head this big. I've seen pictures. Just a head. A great it, big, huge head on him. It, in a way, it was a very welcoming community for oddities. Right. And so what Rasta Promoter did, they would look around and they found these odd people. Now, believe it or not, I was considered one of these odd people during that time. Mm -hmm. If you look at old time wrestler, there was no wrestler back then that was a bodybuilder. It looked nothing like except you in the for 70s. They yeah. really had a few of them. They had superstar Billy Graham. Uh, Rocket Johnson was around, but he wasn't as big as I was. Superstar Billy Graham, I would say, was the only guy with muscle that was as big Close. as me. Yeah. And that's what made superstars so unusual. Here you got this great big guy with the different color tights on. 
uh, 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 with 23-inch arms, you know, for wrestling and the sunglasses and all the, the fur around and that. And then there was another wrestler, Jesse the Body Ventura. He was unusual. The guy come out with the big, the, the flower trunks and, the, and Freddie Blassie and Captain Lou Albano, a guy that got rubber bands, piercing. Captain Lou Albano was the first, Captain Lou Albano was the first guy to do piercings. I remember now that Now it's too. popular. Yep. Everybody got peers. It's not as unusual. It's, uh, Captain Lou Albano fit right in today. Right. But for a guy to pierce his nose or pierce his lip or do piercing in that day, that was very unusual. So back then, they looked for the strange, the uh, uh, unusual uh, weirdness. Right. Well, that didn't just fit with the, the performers in the ring. Most of these guys, I'd say 90% of us, we was more weird outside of the ring than we were in the ring. All right. Well, Tony, we're running out of time here in this great episode, Father's Day weekend, part of Money in the Bank Father's weekend. Day. I Put have on your shoes, lady. Stomp your husband in the I face for only, Father's Day. I have only two, <laughs> two closing questions, Tony. Number one. Did you see my shirt? You're a married man. Yes. What does Mrs. Atlas think about this love of the shoes? A woman cannot change what she married. If you know about it, when you say, I do... Don't try to change it three or four months later. I had my first wife try to do that. I was a professional wrestler. Mm -hmm. She went to the wrestling match one time and saw all the girls screaming and clawing out to me and everything. She didn't want me to wrestle no more. I said, what do you want me to do? She said, we should buy a farm. She wanted me to walk behind a mule. But she didn't want me to wrestle anymore. I had several women that I was married to want me to quit wrestling. Mm -hmm. You go to people that didn't bodybuilding. They want to make their husband quit bodybuilding. Why you got to go to the gym so much? Guys that work jobs. See, most women, not all, they want a man at home, but they still want to pay the bills. You can't be home all the time and pay, pay the, the bills, bills too. Yeah. You can't be in two places at once. So I accept my wife for what she are, and I expect the same for her. She accept me the way I am. But I won't do anything to disrespect the other woman, and I won't do anything to disrespect my wife. All right, Tony, I can only come up with one final thought. Is the best analogy when it comes to you loving the feel of the female shoe on you, is it almost like when Popeye gets his spinach? Exactly. Well, you know what, fans? Maybe we just summed it up in one sentence. For the Hall of Famer, Mr. USA, Tony Atlas, I'm Dan Marotti. We're going to be back next month on WWE Extreme Rules Weekend. It's a very somber anniversary here in professional wrestling. Again, for Tony, I'm Dan Marotti. Continue to visit us on social media and bostonwrestling.com. Until we speak again, enjoy I'll your Father's Day. Kick in the face to you. Father's, enjoy your Father's Day weekend, you and yours. Be well. Kick in the face.